Hello, this is Crystal Stanich, and thank you for joining me for this week's First Chapter Friday. Today I will be reading I, Eliza Hamilton by Susan Holloway Scott. Hope you enjoy. Prologue. New York City, New York, 1804. You know who I am. As much as I would wish it otherwise, I cannot ignore the attention, not now. The sudden rush of interest and recognition as I step from my carriage, the bows and curtsies that quickly give way to the whispered explanations and curious stares with no respect for my mourning or the veil I hoped would keep the keenness of my suffering to myself. Nor does it matter that I have my youngest children with me, little Phil on one side and Betsy on the other, both clinging tightly to my hands and skirts. How can I guard my babies when strangers crowd so close? How can I defend them from those who would steal away not only our home, but also the sweet legacy of their father's love? What can I do when I am all they have left in this world? Yet I will be brave and strong for the sake of my children, our children. That is what my husband would have wanted and what I must do to honor his love. I must give no credence to the lies and calumnies his enemies continue to spread against him and do my best to combat their slanders. I haven't faltered before and I won't now, no matter how sorely tested I might be. Love is not easy with a man chosen by fate for greatness. My Alexander was such a man, a man so bold and brilliant that all others doled in his company. Just as the brightest comet that shoots across the night sky will make the other stars fade meekly in its trail. Yet he was so much more than what the world saw. I knew the rare kindness and gentleness he gave to those he cherished most and the heartfelt tenderness that I miss more sorely than any words can describe. I was not born as clever as my sister Angelica, nor so beautiful as my sister Peggy. I don't possess the gentle serenity that graced my friend Lady Washington, the regal elegance of Mrs. J, or the hospitable ease in company of Mrs. Madison. Yet I maintain I am the most blessed among women because I alone have the love of my dear husband. Chapter one, the pastures. Albany, province of New York, November, 1777. I was 20 years of age when I met Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Hamilton. To be truthful, at first I found little that was memorable regarding him that evening. Because our country was mired in war and my father was a major general of the Continental Army, our house was frequently overrun with young officers, and I was hard pressed to recall one from another. But no, I shouldn't say that about Colonel Hamilton. He did immediately distinguish himself from the others, though not necessarily for reasons he might have wished. Before he arrived, my family and our guests were gathered in the front parlor, as was our custom before we not dined at the pastures, our home here in Albany. Evening came early in November, and the candles were already lit, their glow soft against the yellow wool-flocked papered walls. Papa was standing before the fireplace, where the heat of the fire would ease the perpetual ache of old wounds and gout in his knees for all that he was only 44, while my mother sat in the mahogany armchair beside him. Her silk skirts spread gracefully around her as she greeted their guests. My younger sister, Peggy, and I stood waiting near one of the windows, dressed for evening with silk flowers in our hair and prepared to be charming and agreeable. We knew our roles with company. Our parents were proud of their reputation for hospitality and Peggy and I were as much part of it as the rich meal and imported wines that would be served at table. 
Yet we were also a home suffering beneath a cloud of disgrace. Although my father had served his country and his men with courage and efficiency, his political enemies in Congress had plotted against him. And after the fall of Fort Ticonderoga this past summer, a blow to the cause that even he could not have avoided. He had been removed from his command of the Northern Department. Papa had requested a court martial to clear his name, but his request thus far had been ignored. And the fact that his replacement, General Horatio Gates, had employed Papa's forces and tactics to defeat the British at Saratoga had been especially bitter for Papa. He had considered his career for the Continental Army to be done, and he had given up wearing his uniform. Although he spoke little of it to us, we understood the depths of his disappointment. And as a family, we defended his reputation however we could. Little wonder then that Peggy and I met the arrival of the aide-de-camp from the Army's Commander-in-Chief with wariness, if not open suspicion. Was he bringing further humiliation to our poor father? Was he the bearer of more ill news from the army, more disgrace to tarnish our family's name? Colonel Hamilton himself did little to dispel our suspicions. When his name was called by one of our footmen, he remained standing alone in the room's arched doorway for a moment too long, appraising the room and all of us in it before striding forward to present himself to my parents. It was rude, that pause, especially to my father, still his superior in rank, and it clearly appeared to be born of a surfeit of confidence and perhaps an arrogant desire to be noticed. As unmannerly as such a gamut might be, however, it was also effective. Look at that cocky fellow. Peggy said to me from behind her spread fan, adding a shocked little hiss for emphasis. You know who he is, don't you? Colonel Alexander Hamilton, I said, letting contempt curl through my pronunciation. He wore the elegant blue uniform of an artillery man with buff facings, brass buttons, and buckskin breeches, yet it fit him ill the wool coat hanging loosely about his frame, the cuffs threadbare, and the green sash of an aide-de-camp slung across his chest like an afterthought. No wonder, really, he was slight for a soldier, slender and boyish, with a wind-barn face and reddish gold hair. I cannot fathom why he is here, Peggy said, aside from the fact, of course, that Papa invited him to join us. But then Papa invites everyone. They already met together this afternoon. What could Colonel Hamilton possibly have left to say? One would think a gentleman officer would have declined such an invitation under the circumstances, simply to be respectful. I sniffed with disdain. I doubt Colonel Hamilton has considered respect. Peggy nodded, her gold ear bobs swinging against her cheeks. But Papa is smiling at him, and so is Mama. It was true. Our parents were conversing with the young colonel as if he were the most honored of guests. On the other hand, appearances could be deceiving where Papa was concerned. Our father was so much a Christian gentleman that if he chanced to step upon a den of copperheads in the forest, he'd bow and beg their pardon for having disturbed their rest with his boot. You can't deny that the colonel's a favorite of General Washington, Peggy continued, clearly persuading herself as much as she was of me of the colonel's character. Perhaps he's brought good news from his excellency. Not bad. Papa said Colonel Hamilton has come to Albany on an important military errand, which must be a great honor for a gentleman of his years. And how many years has the colonel seen? I asked Riley, 15, 16? Hush, Peggy scolded. Colonel Hamilton is 20, nor does he have a wife, which you know is why Mama is now greeting him so warmly. That went without saying. 
Although Peggy and I had always been expected to wed gentlemen from among the wealthy, Dutch New York families much like our own, the war had changed everything. The times had become so unpredictable and unsettled that no one was marrying anyone, except, of course, my older sister, Angelica, who had impetuously eloped with an Englishman the year before. All the gentlemen from Albany, who ordinarily would have considered courting Peggy or me, had joined the army instead, and thus Mama wasn't above widening her nets for our matrimonial sakes. Twenty in an unmarried woman was a great deal older than twenty in a bachelor, and Mama made sure that presentable young officers were always welcome at our house. Including, it appeared, Colonel Hamilton, I cautiously continued my own appraisal, still unwilling to abandon my earlier grudge against him. I supposed he was considered handsome, with regular features and a manly jaw, but he also possessed a longish nose that he held raised like an eager hound sniffing the air for a scent and so intent a gaze that he was almost scowling as he listened to my father. Yet he was listening, respectfully, and not attempting, attempting to force his own opinions on Papa the way so many other young officers did. That was in his favor. Perhaps he had brought Papa good news. And reluctantly, my opinion of him rose a fraction. Papa said Colonel Hamilton was attending King's College before the war interrupted his studies. Peggy was saying, he must be vastly clever. I wonder what his prospects might be. While I knew Peggy meant his prospects for inherited property and wealth, considering we'd always been taught to value, I could only think instead of the Colonel's prospects for survival in the army, in the war. I'd already seen too many gentlemen march away to battle and not return. And from unhappy experience, I learned not so much to harden my heart as to guard it against sorrow and loss. Given his size and stature, I doubted Colonel Hamilton's prospects in this way were very promising at all. Yet even as these gloomy thoughts filled my head, the Colonel bowed and turned away from my parents. His gaze met mine and held it. He bowed in acknowledgement. At once, my face grew hot. What lady wishes to be caught boldly staring at a gentleman? Yet, like a deer trapped frozen in a lantern's light, nothing could induce me to look away. His eyes were an unexpected blue, as bright as the summer sky, and at once bold and enticing with more than a bit of sly humor besides. And it was that humor that finally released me too, for as soon as I saw the smile that began to play across his lips, I suddenly was able to shake myself free of his spell. I was no longer captivated. I was mortified. I had already been shamed, but I needed to be laughed at as well. And swiftly I looked away before he'd find further amusement at my expense. And that, is the beginning of chapter one of I, Eliza Hamilton. If you would like to know what happens next, please download this title on the Hoopla app. Thank you and have a great day.